The problem with the way that traditional sex education is done is that it talks to kids as if they don't know anything, as if we are adults are the experts, right? And I want to start with like, you actually know a lot and I have a lot of information to share. You don't know everything. So I say it in the book, like, you know a lot about yourself. You know more about yourself than anyone else. I'm Michael Tamblin, CEO of Rakuten Kobo. This is Kobo in Conversation. My guest today is Corey Silverberg, educator, entrepreneur, researcher, and author of the books What Makes a Baby, Sex is a Funny Word, and the new book titled, you know, Sex. These books are approachable and factual guides to sex and bodies, but also grown-up feelings, experiences, and all kinds of stuff that can be really hard for anyone to talk about. Supported by Fiona Smith's vivid and playful illustrations, Corey Silverberg's writing always finds a humane and plain-spoken way to explain everything from the functioning of the reproductive organs to the nuances of consent and everything else anybody should want to know about how to use their body. Corey Silverberg, welcome to Kobo. Thanks for having me. Your second most recent book, Sex is a Funny Word, is now seven years old, and I feel this kind of the gold standard uh, contemporary classic among sex education writing. In that book, you covered the basics, how bodies look and how they work, how they change during puberty, which it seems one can never be overprepared for. <laughs> but it also talks a lot about feelings and boundaries and wraps useful language around tricky topics. Before we talk about the new book, can you tell me what led you into sex is a funny word in the first place? With all my books, I mean, I'm kind of writing the books that I wish I had. And I became aware after writing the first book, which is really for very young kids, I sort of three or four year olds up to kind of age six is, is a picture book. Um, I became really aware that we do this funny thing with book in, in like book sex, like sex education in books, you know, for sale. So it's different in schools, but we do this thing where we kind of have books about where babies come from, which is something mm -hmm. a lot of kids have questions about as young as three, sort of four or five, six. And then we have books about puberty, which for most kids starts around 10, 11 ish. Um, and, and I realized like, well, we don't have any, where are the books that help us have conversations with our kids during the like age seven, eight, nine, 10, like, mm -hmm. there's these really important years where they have bodies. And of course, when, when, you know, I should say right away, when I talk about sex education, we're not talking about intercourse and activities. We're talking about young children. What we're talking about is boundaries, consent. We are talking about pleasure, but that's really about like, you know, learning how to have, um, make friends and feel joy in your body, rolling down a hill, playing playing sports, whatever it is. Um, and I realized that there really wasn't a book for, for this age group, that we really sort of skip these important years. And so that's really where Sex is a Funny Word started. It was like, what? how do we write a book that is a, sort of, it has the word sex in it, it's about sex, but it's not gonna be about, like there's nothing about reproduction in that second book. There's nothing about where babies come from because I actually don't think that's the key thing that kids that age are interested in, right? They're really interested in, you know, by that age, like some of them, you know, there is a chapter on crushes because that that can be a thing as early as six and seven for some kids. Um, and, and they're interested in like how to navigate relationships, right? Like how do I, you know, friendships are already so dramatic at that age. And these are the building blocks for me of sexuality, right? Like the, the, the nuts and bolts, like the plumbing, you know, we do that in our other books. And it's important, but that's also what, if kids are lucky enough to get sex education, that's what they get. So what they miss and what families often have a hard time finding the opportunity to talk about is all the relationship stuff. And so that's really what Sex is a Funny Word um, was about. And were there any books that you were reacting to or were you really working on the gap between the books that were already there? Well, it's a bit of both, <laughs> right? I mean, I, you know, I mean, so the generous way of responding is like, you know, that, I mean, and it's true, generous and true. We need all the books, right? We really mm -hmm. need 30 or 40 more books that are for kids at, of that age because, because every author is going to bring their own perspective, their own lived experience and their own sort of ped pedagogical way of working. Um, so yeah, but the truth is yes, that, that I was I was I was responding to the books that were out there because I'm queer and 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 when I was a kid, I had access to lots of sex education because of my parents, but none of it really fit for me because it was all very kind of straight, very gender normative. And so even though I looked like the kids in those books, like absolutely, 
you know, I could see the picture and, I, you know, I, it didn't actually help. I kind of yeah. felt like mm, this isn't for me. And I just needed someone to say, you know, in my case, you know, the way you look may not be the way you feel. And I didn't need a lot more than that. That would have been the kind of permission I need to kind of figure stuff out and talk, right? I mean, sort of the goal of all my books is really to get young people talking with the trusted parents or adults in their life. Um, so, yes, yeah, so I was, I, was, I was sort of responding a little bit um, to the books that existed. It's true. Language around sex, gender, gender expression is extra complicated now. <laughs> and that book does something really elegant when it comes to language. It is frank and factual, but also very down to earth. <laughs> and at the same time, you're able to kind of solve some linguistic puzzles of inclusivity, how to describe something accurately and accessibly right and you know not like putting lots of asterisks and, and footnotes right, exactly yes yes was that a challenge you consciously undertook or was that something that just came naturally to you from your lived experience no 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 it, yeah that didn't, didn't come naturally and it took forever i mean that book took i think four years our next book took seven years and a lot of it was that like it's exactly what you said about the asterisks right because when you're writing for kids i think a lot of adults who don't spend a lot of time with kids um, they write books for kids and they and they're not really thinking about kids, right? So they might the language might be a little too adult or just too many words, or honestly, it just gets boring, right? Like you can't, like in that second mm -hmm. book, we do talk about gender diversity, but what we don't do is give a long laundry list of the all the titles and all the identities, because I knew that would just bore kids. So you gotta figure out like how do I do this without the asterisks? And the truth is just just it's, I mean, it's always about keeping it simpler, right? Like how can we pare this down? to be both kind of um, inclusive, which means complicated, but not linguistically complicated. Um, and it took forever. And so the other thing is that, that it is my process, right? So my process actually is, it takes years because I read drafts with families and with kids. And that's what okay. makes them better. Yeah, so, so Fiona does like a black and white drawing. I mean, with Sex and Funny where she was still doing drawings, now it's all digital, but she does sketches. And I, I basically make a zine. I kind of we copy and paste the words into a thing. We put it into a binder. And I go around to families and, you know, it was harder with this new book because part of that happened during COVID, but I literally would go into people's homes and often they would, they would let me sit there while they read it with their kids. And then we just talk and you can tell the things, I mean, it's, it's my favorite thing to do. I don't know if you've ever done this as a book lover and book person, watching people read is actually really fascinating and watching many people read the same thing. It works better with comics, which is what we do, because of course, fiction, <laughs> you read quite slowly. But like watching, like, where are they turning the page? Where are they pausing? Where do they smile? Um, and you can see with kids, the other thing is kids are amazing, you know, uh, very open and honest reviewers. And so you can see when they turn off. Mm -hmm. So it was a lot of that. It was a lot of revisions to figure out how, how to get, keep, keep kids and adults engaged. I mean, there are different problems, right? So kids can just get bored and adults, uh, can, we can shut down because we have our own baggage. Mm -hmm. So how do we kind of keep the adults not shutting down, and how do we keep the kids kind of entertained enough to keep reading? And so in that road testing process that you're doing, how much does the book evolve over time? You kind of go in with a certain picture in your mind of how this whole thing is going to flow. How different is it by the time you've put it in front of all of these different families? A lot. It's like, And, and sometimes both structure... I mean, the structure, you, by now, this was our third book, so the structure kind of held, held its own. But even with sex is a funny word... You know, some of it we were like, oh, we're going to move this thing. You know, this conversation about consent has to actually go earlier because it has to be in place before we do this part. Um, and but a lot of it. So, so there's some structural stuff. A lot of it is language, right? A lot of it is just learning how a better way of saying, you know, um, like connect, you know, like the way you would talk. Because I was trained as a sex educator, really for adults. So you know, I'd talk about like the connection we have. Adults have a sexual connection. Well, that's not a good way to talk to kids. Connection doesn't really make sense. I mean, unless you're talking about connecting a kobo to a plug, for example. Right? right. So a lot of it is the language. I think the other thing is that it's. I really think of myself as a writer. Like I'm not that precious about my words. So I'm quite happy for someone to say like, "This is the wrong word. You should say it this way." And then I'll sit with it. I don't. I very rarely get defensive about that, mm -hmm. um, which I think is it's one of the things that makes me good at this. Because of course, lots of other authors care so much about their words, and that's great. But it would make them not that good at this process because they would be like, "No, I, I want my words." 
<laughs> One of the things that you tackle so well, though, is you know, sex is a, a is a topic that's just loaded with all of these euphemisms and phrases and ways of saying things without saying things, and. It almost seemed like you had a, a list in your head of like, I am going to knock these things down one at a time. Mm-hmm. So was so was there a particular approach that you that you kind of had in your head of, I you know I want to talk about things this way. I want to approach yeah. these topics with this level of, of of kind of direction. Absolutely, yeah. I mean, and and I'll use the example of this term middle parts, which we've sort of introduced, right? So. Often um, there's a part of our parts of our bodies are called private parts. And it's actually when you talk to people who work with uh, around violence um, um, in particular, um, what they tell you right away is it's not a useful term because of course any part of our body should be private, right? So when we tell a child Mm -hmm. the private parts are the parts that are covered by your bathing suit. And then part of the message is like, if a stranger touches your head, just, and it feels weird, just ignore it, that's fine. Right. But that's actually unfortunate. That's not how it works. Right. So strangers that might want to harm us might actually start by patting us on the head, might start with a hand on the shoulder. Mm-hmm. So we changed it. We stopped talking about private parts. We use the term middle parts. This is obviously referring to kind of genitals. And this is the part that are in the middle of our body. Um, so, again, like that's a good example. Right. Like genitals. It's not a great it's not a fun word. Right. I mean, right. at some age, I, of course, at some age, kids do find that a funny word. And obviously the specific words they find funny, too, which I'm all for that. But we, but I keep kind of authorial adult tone in that way. Um, so I knew right away, I knew that I wanted to intervene in that language. And mm-hmm. same with all sorts of other things, right? So a lot of the classic books, they say someone who is gay is a, a gay means a man who has sex with another man. Well, that's actually a very old and narrow understanding of what gay is. It's also about who we want to make family with and who we're in love with, all of these things. So. So I definitely, that's that's an example where I absolutely went in with a list um, knowing that I wanted to introduce these words and just share this language and then hope that it's useful for people. Let's talk about the new book. Okay. Uh, first, can I get you to say the title so I know what it sounds like in your head? Well, you actually said it really well. And I have to tell you that, uh, and you probably know, you talked to a lot of authors, that I that title, it was actually our book designer who picked the title because I, I was really stuck. And I loved the way it looked and I didn't say it out loud hardly ever. And then the first time we were doing like, you know, pre with Penguin Random House, we were doing some Zoom thing before the book came out and everyone was getting it wrong. And, and some people were making it sound like the title was just sex. They were like, you know, the book, their book, you know, sex. So I guess it's, a, it's a, but you actually said it quite lovely, which I think was like, you know, sex. Um, so it's a double kind of, it has many meanings. So part of, part of what I do as a sex educator and what I think is important for all of us to do is honor that we all have knowledge, including young people, right? So young people don't know about sexually transmitted diseases and they may not know where babies come from and they may not have terms like queer or gay or lesbian. And, you know, more and more they do have those terms because of the internet. So they may not have a language, but they have knowledge, right? So every person knows they have a body. Every person of every age knows that their body can feel good sometimes and their body can feel bad sometimes. Every person knows about boundaries and has an experience of when like, you know, like, I mean, you know, as a parent, I know very well, my kid absolutely knows when I'm crossing their boundaries. So if I tell them, if I yell back off because they're about to cross, they're not, or, or look out because they're crossing the street, they're not looking, right? They don't want me to do that, but that's an example of a safety boundary where I'm just gonna, I don't really, I'm not concerned with their feelings in the moment, I'm concerned with mm-hmm. their safety. Um, say, and, say, and, that, and that might include grabbing them, right? So you may grab a kid to pull them out of the road. So, so the, th- the problem with the way that traditional sex education is done is that it talks to kids as, as if they don't know anything, as if we are adults are the experts, right? And I wanna start with like, you actually know a lot and I have a lot of information to share. So it's like, you don't know everything. So I say it in the book, like, you know a lot about yourself. You know more about yourself than anyone else. It doesn't mean you know it all. Um, and so the, this is the, you know, sex, Part of that is like, you actually know about sex. You just don't know it because you think, because we all think that sex is this thing that happens in movies or to make, like you think it's just one thing when sex is really all of these things. So it's that. And then also, of course, we do like playing, I mean, because, uh, you know, it's it's these four characters that we're following through the book and they're going to the sex ed class and they're they're awkward and they're uncomfortable. And so they're, they're the ones that are kind of saying like, you know, sex. Um, so it can be said in many ways. As you said, these books follow the same four kids, Mimi, Mm -hmm. Omar, Cooper, and Zai, as they grow up in new avenues of experience 
open up for them mm-hmm. and we get to know them and their families and and in in the book it's an interesting setup you know you don't jump right into the you know, material about sex or kind of an educational mode we learn about their lives a bit first and their homes and we see them go to school and so tell me a bit about how you're setting the table for us there well, this is, again, I guess, sort of like a response to most sex education books, which are really decontextualized, right? They're just about bodies, right? And mm-hmm. that doesn't, it's not good, it's not good education. <laughs> you you want, and certainly not good storytelling. You want kids to connect with the characters. So we start with the characters. And so, of course, and I, and I would say that, you know, so both Fiona and I, uh, well, Fiona didn't grow up, but we're both from, I've lived in Toronto forever. I grew up in Toronto. Fiona's been a comic artist in Toronto forever. And so the book and the characters look like Toronto. So it is very diverse. And Americans mm-hmm. often talk about that. It's like, it's so diverse, but really it looks a lot like Toronto. <laughs> it, 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 we, do not, we do not have a checklist. <laughs> it's Toronto colored. Yeah. Toronto colored, exactly. Um, and so, so, so but, but having said that, of course, there is some thought to having, you know, so like whether there's kids that have kind of different racial and cultural backgrounds, Omer's disabled, visibly disabled, um, Zai is a queer kid who's gender nonconforming, um, and so we see. And then, and then we also like it was important to see like that you know some of them live in homes and some of them live in apartments. And like Cooper has like twelve hundred siblings and never has privacy. So you know we wanted the book to feel like kids' lives as opposed to feeling like a science lesson that they're supposed to just apply to their lives. And aside from a couple of the examples that you called out, it, it, it seems like deciding who is in that group is a bit of a challenge. Did those did those characters come naturally or were you giving some thought to, I want to, I'm kind of setting up for this kind of representation or I'm setting yeah. up for this kind of situation? I mean, so the funny thing is that Fiona created the characters without knowing. So those three of the four characters appear in What Makes a Baby in a scene. Like, like What Makes a Baby is a classic picture book. It was written as mm-hmm. a picture book. It, but because it's Fiona, it has a feel of a comic. And then I noticed, like I found those, I saw the, ki- the kids. And... Um, and then we added Zai. Um, and so, yeah, so of course, yes, the answer is yes, that like, you know, I knew I wanted a kid that was gonna be questioning their gender. I have to say like in the second book, Zai doesn't have a label because I didn't, I wasn't sure. I wasn't sure where they're gonna end up. So there's a there's a comic though, where like they're, at, they're in the playground and the coach like blows the whistle and says, boys over here, girls over here. And Zai is in the middle and doesn't know what to do. Um, mm-hmm. The nice thing about comics is that we don't have to, we don't have to say what they do. Right, that you can all this so, comics can always be kind of cliff, cliffhangers, and you just and there's so much about the expression on the face that kids and adults can just use that comic to have a conversation, rather than me resolving everything. Um, so, <clears throat> so for sure, you know, I'm I'm a big I'm I'm a part of the disability community, so I knew I wanted I knew I wanted a character who was visibly disabled, um, and um, and I knew that I wanted characters. That had so uh, you know Mimi's also adopted, right? And so I also say a lot of these characters are based on people, um, either people or amalgamations of people I know. So Mimi's um, Chinese Canadian and is adopted by she has these two white gay dads, um, and I just you know because I have friends who that's their experience, that's their family. I know mm-hmm. how rich it is, right? I know how many stories and experiences there are in there, and so we sort of as you said, it's sort of setting the table, um, just just to have a lot. Um, and and we do. And so, yeah. And so then the next book ended up being 432 pages because it was a lot. And for for our listeners, I should just set up uh, to say this is a comic book. You, yeah. you know, this is not you know, an, uh, you know, sort of a book with illustrations. This is not a children's book. There are panels. There are you know, word and thought bubbles. It is it is using all of the visual language of uh, of comics, which as a as an author, were there things that you had to learn or unlearn to to take on that particular visual vocabulary? Yeah. Did you have to internalize that you know that comic world? Yeah, which was great. I mean, I was happy to. I mean, I don't know how you feel, but I love. I mean, I, I mean, I, I, mostly I read graphic novels now. <laughs> like I, still, I still sometimes read books with just words. But, um, but I didn't, you know, but I didn't growing up like less because I wasn't in suit, I wasn't into superheroes and that at the time when I grew up, that was really what most comics were. Um, so yes, I did have to learn and Fiona taught me and Fiona's an expert at it. And I have to say though, it's a total gift because what I learned is I can say less, right? (laughs) Mm -hmm. I could write, I would write like, I would write half a page about gender or something. Fiona would do a drawing and it would do the work of three quarters of what I wrote. 
Um, so it's really just kind of a blessing, but, but it is, um, it, it, but I still overwrite. So that's the thing. My, my, my learning is always, and maybe this is true for other authors, but I mean, I would just write too much and then very quickly realize like, oh, we can just do this. You know, the, the way that comics can, you know, time and space change, you know, you can just bend all these things um, is makes it so much, uh, it's just so much better. I can't, I'm honestly, I cannot imagine, like I'm, you know, I have plans for the next kind of books uh, outside of this series. Uh, and I can't imagine writing a book that's just words. <laughs> And if you didn't have a difficult enough task you know, set out for yourself, you also try not to make sex the be all and end all of grown up experience. You right. make space for asexuality, mm -hmm. attenuated sexual desire mm -hmm. within the space of of sex education too, yeah. which I was like, okay, there's some things that are fairly easy to put into into visual form. Um, you know, putting absence into visual form is, you know, is an even more complicated thing. Yes, it's true. <laughs> but, well, you're right. It's important. But it's important because, again, I don't actually, I mean, I I, have, I, I can't remember. Well, I so so there was just this profile of me in the New York Times. And online, the title was something like, the books that, about sex that every family should read. I much prefer the print edition headline, which was, sex is not for everyone. Um, because that's true. And I do think, so I'm, you know, I'm part of this generation where like this concept of sex positivity kind of came up. And I do think it's sort of misused and misunderstood sometimes to think that like sex is great and we should all be, what we should do is be promoting. We should make sure everyone has great sex. I'm like, we should make sure everyone has a great life. Right. And I just don't think, I mean, I'm, ha you know, I, obviously I think fa sex is fascinating. It's what my work is. But I don't think people need to have sex to have a good life. And and I think and I absolutely it's also just weird. Like this is the weird thing uh, about the sexual like the sexualization of media is like, why on earth are we telling kids like that sex is an, is like a crucial part of being a happy adult? Right. Why would that be like it's, it's it can be. And, and the other thing is, like again, we also I feel like we need to separate sex from reproduction because certainly science has done that for us right it's also like i mm -hmm. this is i'm going off on a tangent but i also have to say one of my problems with a lot of these books is they're out of date right they're out of date right it's, sex is not making babies is not what it once was <laughs> and so many of us like when i wrote this first book i wrote it really it was inspired by a trans family that were in, in my life but it immediately became clear that like in fact even like in my in my personal life that there's so many heterosexual couples that were making babies with help right? Mm -hmm. Sperm donor and egg donor and fertility treatments. And what's different in our generation is that is that more and more parents want to talk, talk to their kids about it, right? So previous generations, well, I guess actually when I grew up, kids still weren't being told a lot if they were often, even if they were adopted, but certainly if there was a donor involved. And now it's understood that it's actually the best practice to let kids know, let kids know early, make it part of their lives. And it comes back to what we were talking about around Asterixes, asterises, right. uh, the, <laughs> that as you are, you know, even if you're just as a parent trying to kind of navigate your, you know, the friends and family around you, you're having to talk about more and more different variations of, of what a family can be right. and where children come from. Right. Um, and you know, that certainly isn't encapsulated anywhere in, you know, in any book on the shelf right now. No. I, it leads me though to my next question, which is, between the the scope that you were trying to tackle and the language and the visual language that you were trying to use to do it, what was the most challenging aspect of sex and intimacy to communicate in the book? You know, it, so so this I'll, I'll give two, and I'll, I'll say, of course, when I, when I was writing it, every, like many of the chapters felt like the hardest. So certainly the easiest answer is the violence chapter, right? So I think it's really important. Often, again, um, just like um, often uh, some sexual violence is separated from sex education and I don't think it should be because unfortunately it's incredibly common. And so we want kids to know, we want kids to know. And, and, and that chapter I wrote in consultation with many professionals who are working with young people um, who've experienced violence. And so we want kids to know this is common. And that's, I mean, I, you know, even in our early drafts, you know, we made it scarier and kind of like uncommon. And they were all saying, do not do that. Because actually this is, this is the social workers were telling me, like actually it, unfortunately it is common. And, and so many kids think they're the only ones that's happening to. 
So we want mm -hmm. kids to know that and we want kids to have language around it, like what, you know, that it happens and what are options to try to make it stop. Um, so that was hard because I, you know, because I'm really a kind of service writer, like I write nonfiction. And, mm -hmm. but, this, but this book, because these characters are real, um, there's more, na there's narrative. And so I had never done that, right? I never actually had to write a story that was so painful and awful. Um, so that was just hard. And then also, this is maybe getting the weeds, but you know, I would literally, so I would write, Fiona would do a draft and then I would show it to the professionals. And then, and then they, so sometimes it would be about changing one, like a couple lines, like an expression. Mm -hmm. Like sometimes they would say, that kid looks too scared. Don't make them look so scared. Because again, what they what they want, they, they say like, you know, so this is getting into deal, but, but uh, you know, a lot of people freeze. They don't, they don't, you know, yeah. they don't yell or run away. And they wanted kids to see that. So the question was what stories were we gonna tell, right? So I knew we were gonna have an online story. So someone is sort of grooming someone online, kind of, you know, an adult mm -hmm. trying to get it, like pull a kid in online. I knew I wanted a teacher and student. And then I knew there should be a family member. And when I wrote the first draft, it was an uncle. And every single professional said, don't do that. Every single professional said, make it a father. And it was hard, right? It was hard yeah. to do, um, but I, I'm not here to write my stories or do it my way. I'm mm -hmm. here to do something that's in service. And when all the professionals were saying exactly the same thing, I did that. Oh, so I should also be clear, we don't show anything explicit. We don't show, you don't see anyone hitting anyone. You don't see right. anyone touching it because we want it to be something that feels safe enough. You know, it is used sometimes in classrooms. So we keep it pretty removed, but it's there. Um, but it was this challenge of like, what do we show, right? Because of course, the very natural, okay intimacy that parents have with their kids is not a problem, right? We don't want to, we don't mm -hmm. certainly want to pathologize touch or a hug or a special treatment. Um, so that was really difficult. And that was where, again, the professionals came in and they were, they gave me, they, they helped me. They gave me very, they said, well, this is the scenario, right? So this is, this scenario is fine. And this is the scenario where there's a boundary that's being crossed and we want kids to see, like they want, they want them to have a flag, like, oh, something's amiss. Mm -hmm. So that was really hard. And then the second one was actually consent, which was hard because consent is complicated, <laughs> right? But for anyone. For, well, but thank you for saying that because the thing is that the way that a lot of education is done now is to say consent is simple. When someone says no, you don't do it, which is absolutely true. If someone says no to you, you stop. But of course, particularly when we're talking about this age, right? So for this group of kids, what we're talking about is like the exploration is like kissing, right? It's kissing, it's holding hands, it's that kind of thing, but it's new. So the complicated thing is we think about consent as like saying yes, agreeing to, to agreeing to do something, but how do you do that when you've never done it before? How do you, mm -hmm. with knowledge, like how do you, um, inf it's like informed consent as a term, but how do you realistically give informed consent? Like, you know, and so of course, like you might, a lot of us, our first experience with kissing was not great, <laughs> right? Does not mean it was violent or an assault, mm -hmm. but so, so it's very complicated. Like, how do you share? Cause, because, because of course, what I want kids to know is they can always say no. And uh, it doesn't have to be that it's violence, right? They have a, they, they can say no, cause they don't like it, right? It's, you know, and that's very confusing, right? Because you, uh, because, because we tend to want to like go for the hard and fast rules, right? And, and also like that, you know, that's the complicated thing where like, I think what's the difference between trying something and being clumsy or being aggressive, right? And, and, and ha you know, and it's not the complicated things, of course, I can't tell a kid that specific because it's all about the moment, it's context, it's power, it's the energy. Um, so it took forever. And, and again, it was, it was made better by lots of professionals, lots of parents, lots of other sex educators, and then, and then kids. Um, although I, I'll say this, because I think you might find this interesting. This is what I learned with this book is um, it's actually not that helpful to uh, have reviewers who are the age of your audience. I showed this book to a lot of 11 and 10, 11, 12 year olds. And they would be like, yeah, you know, either this is funny, this isn't. <laughs> so basically, you're getting critiqued on uh, on humor and the quality of the drugs. Exactly. And the quality of the drugs, exactly, right? A lot of the early versions are like, a lot of the early comments are like, it's too black and white because like Fiona hadn't colored it. And I'm like, that'll come later. <laughs> but, but what I realized is you need kids who know a little bit about what they don't know. So my best reviewers for this book, which the book is sort of geared to like 10 and up, were really like 16, 17, 18, 18 year olds who mm -hmm. still mm -hmm. remember that time much more than I do. At 52 but but who know what they don't know because they're kind of deep in high school 
Um, right. So yeah, so that's how, so the, so the consent, oh, I, I need a lot of help with consent. <laughs> and the, the answer may be the same, but what was the, the section or the topic that changed the most from your initial framing of it to when you put it in front of audiences and started to test it and gauge reactions to it? Actually, it's different. The answer to that is this is the touching part, is the part where we actually, so it's a 432 page book and there's three or four pages about actual sexual activities. Mm -hmm. <laughs> there just isn't a lot about that. Because honestly, I don't, it's not my place. Like I don't, so what we do, I think at that age, it's important that kids know that what intercourse means and what the word oral, oral sex means because they're, they're hearing it, right? They're hearing mm -hmm. it in, in, online and as adults, it's our responsibility just to give them accurate definitions. But I don't need to go into details. Like that's not for me. That's for if, if parents want to explain that stuff in detail, they can do that. Or a kid in their community, maybe they get sex education. Like I'm writing for this vast audience. But I went in thinking I was going to have to do a lot of that. I went in thinking like, okay, like so another example is pornography. So there is a chapter on pornography. I wish there wasn't because I wish that that wasn't something that our kids had easy access to, but they do. So again, it's our responsibility. And I thought I was going to have to get much more explicit. Um, and then as I, as I did drafts and, and read with parents and, and also educators, um, it became clear that no, that actually what I'm really good at is creating the space for people to start asking questions. And you can do that without being a lot of really explicit. So it's sort of providing context. So for example, in the pornography chapter, I wasn't expecting it, but I ended up talking about the industry, right? So I ended up saying like, this is a job and it's like movie making, right? So someone actually makes decisions about everything that you see and they try to make it look real, but it's not. And you need to know that there are people that are doing this and that are getting paid. And, and, and one question we raise at the end of the chapter is like, do you think it's a good job or is a bad job, right? Because I want kids to think, I want them to start thinking about that. And that's one way, you know, rather than just saying pornography is bad, we know that industry, I mean, there's good parts and bad parts like in any industry. And so I want kids to be critically minded about like, you know, labor practices. So like, like the, the nerdy kid, Omar, when he, there's a comic where they all look at, they look at porn. So we don't see the porn, of course, we just see their faces. And then they go home and they all have different responses. And he Googles porn labor standards because he's a nerd. <laughs> and that's where he went. Because he's also yeah. a kid that isn't that interested in sex. So he wasn't titillated. He was just mm -hmm. like, you know, and how so, does this work? Who does this? Exactly. Well, how is this right? a job? How's the job? Right. Um, he's maybe a budding entrepreneur, really, when you think about it. <laughs> um, so so that's the section that I think actually the section about like basically getting into like, well, what is sex? Like, what is the sexual activity part? Um, that section changed the most, I think. These books have been a collaboration with Fiona Smith, mm -hmm. a comic artist and illustrator whose work I, work I have loved for, yikes, decades now. Nice. And, it, and her style of visual storytelling is so integral to how mm -hmm. information is delivered in these books. I, can you tell me how that collaboration has evolved over time is it did you just like hit a rhythm right away or is it something that you've been kind of working and developing how you do that work together i think we've gotten better but it was a rhythm right away because she's so amazing so not only is she i mean i you know i just got this gift of getting to work with someone who came with 25 years experience when we started right and making comics at every level right so she's worked as a graphic illustrator but just making zines and doing serial comics and exclaim and in vice magazine years and years ago. Um, so she had so much knowledge. Um, and so for me, it was actually, it was more about me learning how, what, what to communicate to her. Right. Cause I didn't know actually that, that like the way the comics are often written is like a script. So in the first, so sex is a funny word. I didn't write it as a script. I kind of just wrote it out. And then it, I, I like have like square brackets and say like, maybe we can have a comic like this. Um, so, so did any of those square brackets uh, get used? <laughs> get used? Some of them. Some of them got okay, used. Okay, good. I mean, good. yeah, yeah. Uh, but a lot of, I mean, th that's the other thing is it's it's a really we just have this amazing relationship because she's such a good. Mm. So a lot of the comics in the book, I, I, I say like most of the funny stuff, like eighty percent of what's funny in you know sex is just stuff she wrote because she makes comics. And so she just thinks like this. And also, it also helps that she kind of has the sense of humor of like a thirteen-year-old boy. Um, and I maybe have a sense of humor of like I'm a 60 year old woman or something. So together it works really well. So there's a lot of, you know, um, jokes about farting and bums, um, and they're all Fiona, uh, and kids love them. 
Um, so yeah, so we we had, but we had met actually because I had been a worker owner at a store called Come As You Are, and we had commissioned her to mm-hmm. do some artwork, and then we became friends. That's the other thing I'll say. It's like is that we're friends, and so um, that's that's made it easier because there is a lot. Like so, so I mean, you'd have to ask her, but I, th- I think she feels the same way. Like for me, I've never felt like criticized by her. And whenever whenever she'll ask a question or like mm-hmm, maybe not do it that way. It always feels collaborative. Like it, or it always feels inviting, right? She's also just a very sweet person. Like that's the other thing. She's not. Neither of us have very big e- egos, so it so it doesn't feel like, uh, you know, you're telling me I'm doing it wrong. Um, it's a really we're very like. I mean, you probably know it's very hard to find people that you work with really well. Um, so I feel very lucky. Is she as invested in the educational mission as you are, or is it a communications kind of illustrating challenge for her no 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 she's no because in her work that like that's the interesting like her work and now we're getting to like the like the menstruation section of this book was all her because in fact her work has always been about Mm -hmm. bodies and a lot of it was about sexuality but it was about adult sexuality so um so it's funny for her she talks about that she's kind of coming full circle because she her early career was a lot of stuff about her own life and so and and so adult issues and bodies in sexuality and then she was told at some point to kind of tone that down to get different kinds of work um and now she's coming back to it because as we're as we're starting to make books for older kids it's getting more uh more intense so no no she's like like and, and you know around fat activism and i mean she's always identified herself as a feminist artist mm-hmm. and painter and so i mean she says she learned i mean like so she i mean she doesn't have the education background so she le- gets to learn things while she's doing it but um but no, she's very invested and she's very invested in, I guess both of us feel the same way, which is like, we want this to serve a purpose, right? So it, it isn't so much about like, this is Fiona Smith's vision of periods, or this is Corey Silverberg's vision of consent. Like we have our feelings, we have our ideas. And that's why it, there's, there's, you know, there's, there's feeling and attitude to the book, but we really want it to serve a purpose. And, and so that's why, again, we're very well suited because she's also willing to change illustrations, right? So I also say like, both of us work, like the work that goes into these books is like twice the work that goes into most books because, you know, because Fiona drew the whole book at least twice mm-hmm. um, before doing the final one. And so, because we really, because that's the thing that's like, I and mean, that's where, you know, it's not that sex is this such a different thing, but it's the way that sex is treated that people that we really want to get the visuals right. Like we want, you know, so, you, and it's like, so for example, there's always an eye on like, you, you do, I don't, I didn't, I don't want it to be, you know, I don't want it to seem titillating. Now I, I'm going to now also go on a tangent and just say, it's interesting because now that we're getting into kind of where like the next book would be for teenagers. And the truth is like, I of course remember like looking through like Judy, like reading Judy Bloom books for the sex yeah. parts. And like, that's totally fine and totally, uh, you know, healthy or, you know, predictable. So I'm going to have to, as we do the next book, we'll have to change that. But I, but because it's comics, it felt like, I mean, it did feel like a boundary. Like we want to be the trusted adults. Not the, we're, we're not there to kind of entertain, mm-hmm. although we do want to be kind of funny. So it is, there is this weird balance. But so yeah, anyway, that's a long way of saying yes. She's very committed to the educational part. And, and she shows that by being open to changing, to changing stuff to make it fit the, the, the message. Do I understand correctly that sex education is kind of the family business for you? Well, it's sexist. It's a weird way. Of <laughs> so my dad, I mean, let me very quickly explain that. So he was a sex therapist. So my dad grew up in Toronto. My dad was a family doctor. But by the, I think actually it was around when I was born. So I was born in 1970. It was around that time. He had a lot, I mean, as he, as, as I remember him telling me the story, uh, a lot of his patients would ask him questions about sex. And he was very interested in that. And so he went to get trained, right? And so this was the 70s. So he got trained by like the classic people who do trainings. Like I'm pretty sure he like went to the Masters in Johnson's mm-hmm. place and did training. And he was, so he was a sex therapist, a, a medical doctor. So that's, that's different than sex education, right? So he would work with individuals and right. couples. It's more focused on like dysfunction. Um, but, but he also did, I mean, like, by, I mean, part of every, anyone who talks about sex, part of their job is education because so much of it, and he would always say like, so much of what he does is just convey simple information that people didn't get, right? Because this is obviously, this was the seventies and the eighties pre-internet. There was so little sex edu- sex information, right? Before sex in the city, there was so little opportunity to even talk about sexual feelings and relationships. Um, so yeah, so he did that. Um, and my mom was a children's librarian. 
um, before I was born and then went on to be like an educator sort of and a trainer. Um, so I did have, as I mentioned, like I, mean, I did grow up, I was primed for it. I never thought, I actually, I didn't think it was, I didn't think I was going to do it. But then he actually got me a job when I was um, a teenager at a sex store in Toronto, a really nice sex store that was owned by these two women. Um, that was this amazing job. And I mean, I don't know what people think when they hear that. Like it, it was a very, it was kind of a family business yeah. in a way. So uh, it was the best job I ever had. And so I worked there and then in those kinds of stores for like 20 years. Um, so it's definitely, I, like, it's like the way I often describe it is like, I grew up knowing that sexuality was a legitimate topic for work, right? Which is rare, right? So most people think of it as like this kind of segmented part of your life. And, you know, maybe it's a thing, maybe it's a thing you do, or it's a thing you get to, maybe you go see a sexy movie, but it's not, it's not something you do for a living. I always knew that the topic was something I could do for a living. Um, and so I thought I was going to be a therapist, but it, I, I, I'm, I'm, my energy is better suited to education. <laughs> That's what I became. There are a lot of parents out there who have trouble talking about uh, sex with their kids um, and have trouble talking about intimacy with their children. Uh, and Sometimes that's because their parents weren't great at it, so they aren't great at it. They don't, mm -hmm. you know, they don't have models to work from, and so sometimes you know, these books may be the main source of information that some kids get. Are you mm -hmm. approaching these from that perspective, or are you are you assuming as you're going through this, like I'm going to cover these things, but then I'm I'm assuming that other sources will fill in some of these other blanks. So no, I'm not assuming. I'm not assuming that anyone's filling in anything else. But I also don't take responsibility for being the only sex education that a young person is going to get, okay. right? So I don't think. I think it's too mm -hmm. much, right? And so I'm very clear about the fact that, like, I don't. We don't cover everything. We cover a lot. And also, it's just me and Fiona. I mean, we have a lot of people who helped us. But you know, this is one book with one perspective. So I always tell parents, like, get. Get, you know, you know, get trying to get my books if you want, but like also think about other books, right? You know, know that there are other ways of doing it, um, and that it's a lifelong. I mean, obviously, it's a lifelong thing. It seems like a cliche, but like we all like there's this myth about like that we and we sort of teach kids this like you get sex education until you're 18 and then it's over, right? You're then you're an adult and somehow you're fine. <laughs> and I think we all know that is not the way it works. Um, so um, so yeah, so I do think so so, but I don't assume. I don't assume that kids are coming to this book with a lot of previous information. The other thing is like, I also don't assume that kids are coming to this book with only like good, positive or healthy experiences, mm -hmm. right? So we write our book, we do, we write our books for kids who have experienced violence, not necessarily sexual violence, but that's part of it. But kids who are escaping war or who are, you know, trying to cross a border um, um, for a better life. Um, and so, so I, this is a difference in our books is that we are writing for kids in the world, as opposed to kind of, there's a, a lot of this material is written for this kind of generic kid that doesn't exist, who like doesn't know, like has never experienced any kind of, like, and when I say violence, that can include mm -hmm. bullying, right? Or anything like that. So I definitely, I, 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 I th this is the hardest part. I think about kids all the time as I'm writing, and I think about a lot of different kids including like the different kinds of family makeup, but also what does it mean to say this to a child who has never heard anything, has, ha, you know, hasn't been exposed to YouTube videos. Um, um, so yeah, so I definitely, I, I, I definitely don't, don't make assumptions about the knowledge they have, but my kind of out, which is kind of a disability justice principle is like, it's not like, it's not reasonable to think that you're going to be everything mm -hmm. to everyone, right? That you are part of, that we do it together. Right. So it's interdependence, the idea that like I'm going to do this. And and it's also I also tell parents our books do this is maybe an anti sales pitch, but like they do raise questions. Right. They, the, the books don't answer all the questions. The books give a lot of information and they absolutely raise more questions. <laughs> they will they cause answer. you to do work. Exactly. They will cause you to do work. Uh, so so which is a switch. Like it's like a lot of parents, but like parents, I mean, uh, parents, I find like really we uh, approach it with some sense of humor where they like. I just want the book so I can just give it to them and they'll do it on their own. But most of them know that in fact, they need to talk to their kids too. And I certainly believe that. I mean, like the thing, again, so much of the way that we write, that I write is um, is not to tell people what they, how to talk to their kids, right? It's like, you actually, like, no one's gonna do this better than you, even though you're gonna mess up because I mean, I mess up because we all mess up, right? But it happened like, like it isn't, we still, you know, we still sometimes talk about sex as if it's this objective scientific fact 
and some elements, there's a few things like how you make a baby and how a condom works, but most of what young people want to know is not fact, it's factual. It's about relationships, it's about culture and values and beliefs. And I'm not like, it's not, it's not on me. Like we don't, we don't want strangers teaching our kids that. It's good as they get older to be exposed to different things, values and beliefs. But uh, I want, I want kids to hear it from like from within their well, and I think so many parents are looking for on ramps they're not it's not that they're afraid yeah. of the conversation yeah. it's how do you start the conversation how do you frame it how do you get kids to a place where um where you can you can have that discussion yeah exactly you've said a little bit about the next book and you're moving mm -hmm. into into teenage years and mm -hmm. and if so if you look at these books as tools to help a young person have a healthy relationship with their bodies, their sexuality, their relationships, mm -hmm. and you know, not a lot about the mechanics of sex itself. Right. What are some of the challenges that you're looking to and kind of looking forward to as you project this into the teen years? Well, it is that last part, right? It's like that, okay, so now I think we do start talking about the mechanics. Mm -hmm. um, um, and so, and, and I just haven't, I haven't conceptualized it yet, right? So for me, the challenge is like, Again, because I want to write for as many people as I can, so it doesn't work. Uh, I don't know if this is uh, like it doesn't work to say that like sex a, sex act A is okay to say masturbation. Can yes, I say you masturbation? can. Okay, I, I, I just did, so I know it's <laughs> so it doesn't work to say this is what masturbation is because in fact it's different mm -hmm. for different people, right? We all think that we know what it is, but actually we all have different bodies. So so it actually and I, and I can tell you this because part of my job used to be to, I've talked to thousands of people one-on-one -on -one about their actual sex lives. So I actually have a repository of information about how diverse humans are. Um, so so I have, yeah, so the question is, how do you start talking about the sexy parts um, while still leaving it open? That's one thing. Um, you know, I, I guess, I mean, we really, the, net, the, the you know, sex just came out, so I have not got my head into it right. just yet. We know, you know, our goal, because basically we want, we want to keep making these books until we die. So we want, like, there to be the one for people in their 70s and 80s. Um, Fiona's, like, very, you know, very excited about doing one that will include um, menopause. Um, so, so, but we do need one more teenage one. So there's going to be a teenager one, and then it's going to get into their 20s. Um, I think what will be interesting with the teenage one is, to, is, is how much of it is going to be about relationships. Right um, versus sort of sexual, like again, like the mechanics mm -hmm. of sex and things like you know even even in this book because this book is for uh, just puberty age kids. There's a little bit about sexually transmitted diseases, but there's not a lot because we know survey wise the majority of our readers are not engaging in activities where that's going to be an issue yet. Um, so yeah, so I th I think I guess so you're the first person who's asked me this question. So the challenge is going to be. How do I, I mean, what I'm going to do is I'll do what I always do, which is I look at all the sex education that's out there and I'll think about like what needs to be added, right? What, what, what needs to be done differently? And I think that, that there's such a trope, like there, there just isn't that much good sex ed for, for the age, like for under, you know, puberty mm -hmm. and below. There wasn't that much. There are some books, but there's just not much. There's so much more for older kids. So I think the challenge will be like, how do I not fall into the pitfalls of kind of tropes about being a teenager you know, it's just all, it's, it's all these stories we tell ourselves and each other. And then it's this funny thing. It's like, it doesn't work that way. But then by the time we get older, then we remember our teen years in that way, mm -hmm. right? And then you're um, working through your own, strange, you know, teenage right? issues at the same time as you're trying to be an educator. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Exactly. Yes. Well, and I will be doing that. Yes. So, so, so that's absolutely true is I will be, and those were worse years. I should have said that actually. <laughs> Thank you. That's, a, that's the therapist answer is the biggest challenge is like, I'm going to be re-traumatized uh, from my teenage years, which were actually worse than my adolescent years. So I'll let you know how it goes. Cannot wait. Well, and, and, <laughs> and the nice thing is that at a certain point you have, you know, a generation of young people who are just sort of moving along with you as, uh, as you progress through the, uh, through the age ranges. So, uh, yeah, that's the hope. Your challenge is going to be actually keeping up with chronology as you, you know, as you jump in these sort of five year increments. It means yes. that the books can't take longer than five years to write. This is the thing. Yes. I, so I need to speed up. It'll be interesting. I, I also, also say this is because is, I, I used to be in retail. I, I love talking about retail. I'm also very interested at the point, which I think it's still two books away, when it's not parents who buy the books, right? right? So right now, the fact is that like I, we don't, mar you know, the the when I most of my workshop. I mean, I do talk, I do go to school sometimes, but most of the work I do is with adults, is with parents. Um, 
And so when I write the book for people in their twenties, it's going to be a book that they're going to buy. So I'll be very interested as to like how my, like my relationship with my readers is, is always mediated through adults, which is very appropriate at this time. Um, so I will be interested when that changes. Well, and then, and then you'll get the other flip, you know, you know, a few decades along later where it's actually, you know, children try to understand what's going on with their parents. <laughs> right. Yes. You're right. Get ready. I will. I will. I am. <laughs> Corey, thank you so much for joining us. Oh, you're welcome. Thanks for having me. I have been speaking with Corey Silverberg, author of the new book, you know, Sex. Find links to it, to Corey's other books at kobo.com slash conversation. Click the show notes for a link. Wherever you're listening, why don't you take a couple of seconds to subscribe so you never miss a conversation with any of the authors we get to talk to Kobo and Conversation is produced by Nathan Maharaj and hosted by me, Michael Tamlin. Thank you for listening.